This is Ray Moss Older, and we are in Chapter 12 of Dear and Glorious Physician, The Story of Luke, Dr. Luke, written by Taylor Caldwell. The cypress trees still stand at the door of the house of Diodorus, and at this door said Iris to her son, a desperate father weeps for his child. A broken-hearted mother is inconsolable. And I, I am but your mother. Remember your father, but only you suffer. You hear no cry of bereavement but your own. When you were a child, you lived as a child. But you're now a man and should put aside childish things. Did you think the world all one dream of sweetness and happiness? That's the dream of fools, of those who would be children forever. Of those who cower should never hear the voice of tragedy, happiness. Those who say it exists, that it should exist, that men are entitled to it because they have merely been born, are like idiot children whose bumbling lips are smeared with honey. You have shut your door to that poor slave, your tutor Kusa, and to the physician Kepta. You've shut your door in my face. You will revenge yourself on the world because one you love has left you. You will revenge yourself on Diodorus, who loves you and cherishes you as a son. You will revenge yourself on the gods. You will wander away and then will be desolate, you believe. But I tell you that Diodorus will be comforted when his child is born. And he will forget you or think of you with contempt. Your tutor will have another pupil. Only I will remember you. I, your mother, whom you've not seen as a woman without a husband and without a son. She trembled in her anger beyond the doors and the windows, the odd and old rains and winds mourned. It was autumn. Iris had entered her son's bedroom. The sad twilight showed him at his table, his head in his hands. But for the first time in a long while, he was listening. Finally, he lifted his head and looked at his mother and saw her. His haggard face became contorted with speechless pain. Oh, you have been so blessed. You've been surrounded by love. You're not a slave, you're a free man, born free. What do you know of the world's terrible sorrow and agony? You're young, you've been nurtured, but you will not lift up your pain and carry it like a man. Orpheus, you must weep forever. I have seen suffering and death many times said Lucanus in the hoarse voice of one who has been silent too long. 
I'm not unfamiliar with them. Now his sunken eyes glittered in the dusk, and he clenched his fists on the table. Do you know what my thoughts have been these weeks? That God is a torturer, that the world is a circus where men and beasts are done to death savagely, without reason, without consolation. Iris rejoiced in herself that her son had finally shown some emotion. But she said sternly, It is an evil thing to blaspheme the gods. But Lucana's words poured from him like some release stream. Why is a man born? He's born only to writhe and torment, and then to die as ignominiously as he lived, and as darkly. He cries to God, and there is no answer. He appeals to God. He appeals to an executioner. He cries to God. His days are short, and never free from trouble or pain. His mouth is extinguished with dust, and he goes down into the grave, and the awful enigma of his being remains. Who has returned from the grave with a message of comfort? What God has ever said, Arise, and I will lighten your burden and lead your life. Now, there's been no such God, nor will there ever be such a God. He is our enemy. He looked at his fists, then opened them, then turned them over to contemplate his palms and his fingers. His face became harsh and stern with wrath. I shall learn to defeat him. I shall snatch his victims from him. I shall take away his pain from the helpless. When he stretches forth his hand for a child, I'll strike that hand down. Where he decrees death, I shall decree life. That will be my vengeance upon him. He stood up. He was weak from little nourishment. He swayed and caught the edge of the table. He stood and looked at his beautiful mother and saw the tears in her eyes. He cried out and fell on his knees before her and wound his arms about her waist and laid his head against her body. She put her hands on his head and silently blessed him, then, then bent and kissed his forehead. Hippocrates it says that this vile thing is sometimes healed spontaneously, said Kepta. Once he remarked it was a visitation from the gods, who certainly in this event are no better than men. He recommends effusions and distillations of certain herbs to relieve the exquisite torment and advises tampons soaked in wine and potions for the alleviation of women afflicted by the disease, which devours them in their secret places. For men, he advises cauterizations and castrations. He thinks of it only as a disease of the private parts though he is troubled in some of his assertions. Is it a single disease or many? A pupil of his thought akin to leprosy, when it attacks the skin, is it the same thing when a mole enlarges and blackens and kills quickly? Is it the white sickness also? The sickness that destroys the blood and makes it sticky to the touch like syrup? Is it that which decays the kidneys, 
the lungs, the spleen, the bowels. Hippocrates isn't sure, but I am sure. It is the same evil with different manifestations. And the worst of all evils, for it comes like a thief in the night. And only at the last does the victim cry out and beg for death when the knife turns and turns in his parts. He and Lucanus were in the small hospital set aside for the slaves. Five beds were occupied by groaning and tossing men and women. Three slaves followed them with brazen bowls, oils, and strips of white linen. Another slave carried a tray of small vessels filled with liquid. The physician and Lucanus had paused beside the bed of a man who was gasping in the purest agony. The left side of his face was eaten away as by a monstrous maggot, the flesh raw and mangled, the lips swollen and oozing with blood. The slave looked up at the physician who contemplated him in sorrow, and Lucina stood and gazed at him with bitter despair. He murmured to Kepta, Surely it would be merciful to give him a portion to bring him peace and death. Kepta shook his head slowly, Hippocrates has declared that it is forbidden. Who knows at what instant the soul shall recognize God? Shall we kill the sufferer tonight, when in the morning the recognition would come? Besides, man can't give life. Therefore, it's not for him to give death. These are reserved only for him who is unknowable to our natures and who moves in mysteries. Kill me, cried the slave, lashing on his bed. He seized the physician's arm in a skeletonized hand. Give me death. His voice gurgled in a rush of blood. Kepta turned to Lucanus, who was looking with horror at the sufferer. He touched his arm, and Lucanus moved his head and stood at, stared at him with obdurate severity and pleading. Would you have deprived Rubria of one hour of her life? And I tell you, she suffered as much as this, and even more. He soaked a pad of linen in a portion of white liquid which he poured from a vessel. Lucanus clenched his teeth with hatred. What had this poor slave, a gardener, done against the gods to deserve this? He'd been a gentle and innocent soul, delighting in the flowers, proud of his borders, loving his lilies, soothing as a father to his roses. There were millions less worthy of peace and life than he. The world was filled with monsters who ate and drank and laughed, and whose children danced in the pleasant gardens of their homes and knew no blight. Kept up with great gentleness, took the slave's darting hand and held it firmly. Listen to me, for you are a good man and will understand. There are those who have this disease, but of the spirit. And I tell you, they endure 
more than you. Where your mouth gushes blood, their souls gush violence and venom. Where your flesh is torn, there their hearts are torn. Niger, I swear to you that you are luckier than they. The slave began to whimper, and his eyes became full and still. He whispered through his blood, Yes, master. Wild scorn was like an acid in Lucanus. He watched Kepta lay the soaked linen on the awful and disfigured face. The slave panted. The other slaves, less afflicted, watched from their beds. Then at last, into the slave's eyes, there came a moist relief, a tremulous surcease. A tear ran from the corner of his eyelid. Kepta took a goblet and put his arm under the slave's head and lifted it as tenderly as a mother lifts a child. And he put the goblet to the twisted lip and put his arm under the slave's head and lifted it as tenderly as a mother lifts a child. And he put the goblet to the twisted lip and slowly Niger drank with touching obedience. When Kepta replaced his head on the pillow, Niger had already fallen into his sleep, moaning softly. Kepta contemplated him enigmatically for long moments, his dusky face with his hooded eyes was unreadable. It has already invaded the larynx. He won't live long. He turned to one of the slaves, give him this potion whenever he can, bear it any longer, but never more than every three hours according to the water clock. And that is all you can do? No. Had he come to me when the first small hard white sore had appeared on his inner cheek, I could have burned it out with a hot iron. He didn't come to me until it was very difficult for him to swallow, and the inner parts of his mouth were already bleeding and corroded and sloughing away. Remember that whether it is an illness of the spirit or of the flesh, it's best to seek counsel and help at the very beginning. Later, all is lost. They moved to the bed of a young female slave who was hardly less tormented than Niger. Her bed was foul with drainings from her vagina. Kepta swung on a slave and exclaimed, Have I not told you to keep the linen dry and pure? This is poison which is leaving her. I shall report you to the overseer, so prepare yourself for a flogging. Master, I have other duties, whined the slave. There is no greater duty than to heal or alleviate suffering. Truly, medicine is the divine art. Enough. Do your work better, and I shall forget the flogging. The slave girl, in spite of her disablement and fever, was pretty and appealing, and kept it touched her forehead, feeling its heat. He said to Lucanus, she attempted an abortion on herself with a filthy and primitive instrument, which the savages use, and this is the result. I could not have a child born into slavery, 
wept the girl. Kepta said somberly, the thought was virtuous, the deed was not. You should have clung to the virtue. Have you a bad master? Had you asked him for a husband, he would have given you one. This is a virtuous household. But you dallied out of wantonness and lust. You had no excuse. You were taught to read and write, to spin and to sew, to cook and render other valuable services. You were not as the slaves in Rome, summoned to the bed of the master at his will. Ah, well, let us look at you. But first he washed his hands with water and then rubbed them with pungent oil. Then he examined the weeping girl and touched her inflamed and pus-streaming parts. Will I die, master? cried Julia in terror. Kepta didn't reply. He twisted a piece of linen into a thin cone of whiteness. He dipped it into fluid from one of his vessels. The girl blanched but kept a firmly separated legs and thrust the cone into her body. She screamed. The air was filled with an aromatic odor. Let the tampon remain until night. Kepta directed his slave assistant. Then remove it and destroy it. It is contaminated and it is dangerous. Afterwards, wash the parts with flowing clear water. Make another tampon and let the girl herself insert it. By then it will be less painful. He patted the girl's wet hands, gave her something to drink. He said to her, you won't die. I pray you'll live to sin some more, I'm afraid. He looked at Lucanus, visitor at nightfall, and forced my orders. Why do you reproach this poor child? asked Lucanus resentfully. Is she greater than her nature, with which your God endowed her? He gave her normal instincts. Where normal instincts can be dangerous, then one controls them. And what is normal? The world. One must have discipline to defeat the urgings of the world. A man is no more than a beast. The girl, somewhat relieved, smiled at Lucanus coquettishly. He turned away, sad but revolted. The windows were open to cool, wintry air, and breezes filled the room. Air and light are enemies of disease, said Kepta against all the advice of every other physician. Cleanliness is also an end they made, not to mention self-respect and esteem for the flesh in which the spirit is clothed. They stopped at the bed of a young and comely woman with a huge belly. Beside her crouched her equally young and handsome husband, whose face was stained with tears. He rose eagerly and looked at Kepta with bright and urgent eyes. A master, surely she's with child and it's about to be born, kept aside. I have told you, loggers, this is no child, but a great tumor. She must be relieved of it or she will die. I have left it in your hands, though I could have operated before. 
you've waited. So you've diminished the chances for her life. I can't wait any longer. Make your choice now. Master, I'm only a slave. You have only to command, said Glaucus tearfully. Kepta shook his head. No man is a slave, no matter how bound and chained, until he admits he's a slave. You are a man. Shall I save your wife now? Or will you wait and let her die? She will surely die without the operation. She may live, may live, if I perform it. He turned to Lucanus. Palpate the belly. Lucanus was full of pity for this stoic young woman who didn't cry, but only smiled bravely. He lifted her sheet. The belly was as smooth and veined as marble and glimmered with stretched tension. He felt it carefully, closing his eyes as to concentrate through his gentle fingers. It was like feeling stone over her right side. But there was a gurgling of liquid and a sponginess as he moved his fingers to the embolsum. I'm certain it is not carcinoma, he said to Kepta, who nodded in his, in a pleased way. It is a lipoid and serum tumor. It's very common. Should have been removed months ago. But this is a couple of long for a child to believe the tumor was one after three years of marriage. It is fastened to the right ovary, which will have to be removed also. Then she will have no child, or only a girl. Don't be foolish. Aristotle dismissed the ancient theory that one ovary produces a girl, or a boy, or one testy produces only one sex. Your wife will have her left ovary, and it is the mysterious choice of God whether she will later have a son or a daughter. He ground some fresh and acrid leaves in a pestle, added a little wine, and gave the result to Hebra, who took it obediently. Kepta said to one of the slaves, Stay with her and give her a large goblet of wine and then another, when she sleeps, call me. Hebra's eyes were beginning to close while her husband watched her fearfully. She languidly raised her kind hand and touched his cheek in consolation. Women, you observe, are less afraid of death and life than our men, Kepta said to Lucanus as they moved to another bed. Is it faith? Or as women are realists, do they accept reality with better spirit? Lucanus glanced at him sullenly. Perhaps, he thought. All these remarks which had been directed to him this first morning of his return to the house of Diodorus and his lessons were subtle barbs for his sensibilities and reproofs. He was angered and ashamed. The man in the next bed was grossly fat and as white and flaccid as dough. He regarded Kepta in resentful silence. Kepta looked at the little table beside him, 
on which did a pitcher of water and a goblet. You have drunk all this water today, my friend? The man muttered something in his throat. An odor of apples or hay floated in his heavy breath. I warned you months ago to limit your love for pastries and breads and honeys, said Kepta sternly. I told you you had the sweet sickness and that if you didn't take care, your very muscles and bones would run, run from you in a river of urine. But I see that you haven't confined yourself to lean meats and vegetables, both of which are plentiful in this household, which believes in sufficient food for his slaves. If you don't control your pig's appetite, then you'll die very soon in convulsions. Yours is the choice. Take it. He turned to Lucanus and gave him a brief talk on the subject of the sickness. Always a man is his own disease. He was afflicted with the sweet sickness, where the very urine is saccharine, is often found to be a, a self-indulgent temperament, which arises from a selfish refusal to cherish others, but only himself. The others do not love him to satisfy his natural human cravings. For love, he eats of the sweets of the earth rather than the sweets of the spirit. There are other manifestations of this disease, especially in children who invariably die of it. It would be interesting to talk with these children who even in their tender years are possibly of a greedy disposition, caring only for self. We can do nothing but prescribe the leanest of meat, the starchless vegetables and fruits, and restrict or omit the sweets and starches. Little, however, will be accomplished except painful deprivation and prolonging of a restricted life unless the patient has an awakening of the spirit and thus is enabled to love beyond himself. He looked at the sulky slave who had been watching him with rapidly blinking eyes. Look on your wife with love, he said. Say not, she belongs to me and she will serve me. Say in your heart, brother, this is my beloved wife, and what can I do to make her the happiest of women so that she is married to the kindest and noblest of men? As they moved away, Lucana said, then this isn't an organic disease? Kepta stopped and pondered. He finally said, there's no separating the flesh from the spirit. For it is through the flesh that the spirit manifests itself. You're wondering how it is that some people contract illnesses and epidemics and others don't. Hippocrates talked of natural immunity in those who escape. One of his pupils believed that those who escape manufacture some essence in themselves which repels the disease. But why? Could it be that certain temperaments resist infection where others don't? Immunity? If so, then, it's the immunity of the spirit. Though other physicians don't believe this, I'm not speaking of good and evil, I'm speaking only of temperament. They came to the last bed. Here lay a youth in high fever, his right leg contracted, 
so that the muscles stood out like ridges. He had a sharp, dark face with unusual intelligence, bold eyes, and an angry expression. Kepta looked at one of the attendant slaves. I have said that this leg must be wrapped constantly in hot woolen compresses day and night, as hot as he can endure it. Give me no excuses. Vexed, he lifted his hand and struck the slave on the cheek. Have we nothing here but men and women who seek only their own pleasures and satisfactions? Go to. He looked down at the young man on the bed. He said to Lucanus, Here is a youth of haughty, proud, and inconsiderate nature, overweening in self-esteem and arrogant. He despises ignorance and dullness. He has a mind like the thin blade of a very sharp knife. He loathes his fellow men, who rarely have his intelligence. He has no patience, no kindliness. I've taught him to read and write. He has access to my own library. He comes and goes at will. He never thinks with his heart, but only with his brain. You'll discover that such as he are very susceptible to this crippling disease. You'll also discover that the more stupid, the more bovine, rarely contracted, even among children. Diomed was smiling with mingled pride and ill humor. Thank you, Master, for your words about my intellect. He was evidently in great pain, but his pride wouldn't permit an expression of it. I'm not flattering you. It was almost inevitable that you have this miserable illness, which I'm afraid is going to leave you with a limping leg. I care little for my body, if I may nourish my mind. Kepta looked at Lucanus. You will observe this trait in people afflicted like this. Why should a man despise his flesh and the flesh of others when it is a marvelous invention of God's and can be more beautiful than any other living thing? It is through his flesh that he communicates with others. Men like Domad with no communication. They crave only obedience and flattery for their truly fine minds. I said to parents like these, teach your child to love and to give and train him in reverence for God. Lucanus lip curled, but he said nothing. Kepta said to Diamond, I shall have some books sent to you this afternoon. I see you've finished those I've previously sent. In the meantime, there is the maiden Lida, who often writes the letters for the Lady Aurelia. She's a pretty child, intelligent and loving, and she adores you. Take her love and return it with your whole heart. I know such a thing will be hard for you, but you can will yourself to love if you wish. Nothing's impossible with a seeking and determined and intellectual mind. The Lady Aurelia is so attached to this girl that she has told me that when she wishes to marry, she will receive her freedom. Will you withhold that gift from her? Diamond began to sneer. Then his face softened and he suddenly turned it to his pillow. 
His thin shoulders heaved. Kepta said softly, There have been more souls saved through humble tears than all the potions in the world. Lucana said defiantly in himself, he simplifies too much. But he was moved by the sobbing of Diamond, who could not control himself through all his muscles because they were contracted in that effort. Kepta said, hasten and get well, Diamond. I shall need you as my assistant when you feel pity and love for others. Diamond reared his tear-wet face from the pillow, and joy shone in his eyes. He caught kept his hand. You will let me attend you, Master? He cried incredulously. Kepta smiled. You will make an excellent helper, Diamond. When you love and have mercy and feel another's pain in your own body. They returned to the bed of Hebra, who was as one asleep, gently breathing. Kepta ordered screens which were placed about the bed. He drove Glaucus from the enclosure. He placed a tray on the small table, and on it were needles and sutures, and large and two small scalpels. He said to Lucanus, It is time for you to see your first operation. If you vomit, kindly use this bucket, but say nothing. If you faint, I shall let you lie. There's a length to save. I'll need your help. Take up that pad of linen and dip it in this pungent oil. There is infection in the very air. Lucanus began to tremble, but he obeyed orders silently. He looked down at the drugged girl who was sweet in her slumber. He was filled with a passionate commiseration. Why should any god so afflict a child who wanted only children and the love of her husband and a tranquil life? Oh, you who do this evil to men, I despise you, he thought. Would not even the basest of men be more compassionate. Kepta exposed Hebra's gleaming taut belly. He palpitated it with care. Then with sure strokes of his scalpel, as one drawing a careful diagram, he drew the knife over the white flesh. Its path was followed by a red streak, which widened, opened, like a hungry mouth. Lucanus sickened, but he watched. Now the shining red muscles were exposed, sinewy, threaded with pulsing veins. Kepta pushed them aside deftly and gently, and said, Now, we will use the Egyptian hooks to ligature all blood vessels to keep the field of operation as free as possible and to prevent bleeding to death. Now observe these vessels and the pulses of the heart which throb them. Isn't it all perfect? Who can look at this and not reverence God in his heart? He's designed a man as wonderfully as he's designed the suns and their planets. Now be careful. Use those small pads of linen 
to keep the wound open. Don't let your fingers touch any part of the wound, for there is poison on your fingers and in the air. The Egyptians knew that many hundreds of years ago, but the Greeks and Romans derided asking, where is the poison? We do not see it. There are millions of things in the universe that men can't see. Nevertheless, they are there. Hebrew began to groan to talk incoherently. It is her resulted flesh which speaks. The spirit is also protesting the ignominy of its passiveness under the drug. There are those who say drugs subdue the spirit. It's not so. Does she feel the pain? Surely. But when she awakens, she'll not remember that she suffered. She will say, I was as one who slept through a storm. Lucanus, filled with pity for the girl, said deep in his soul to her, Rest. Endure, be of courage. We will save you, dear child. He directed the full force of his mind to her to reassure her. Perhaps it was only the drug she had taken and the stupefying wine. But all at once she sighed and relaxed. The tight muscles became soft, no longer tensed. The gray, pink, and glistening intestines were exposed now. Here they were, in their convolutions, slipping mass after mass. They palpitated, writhing a little, and Lucina spoke to them kindly in his mind and they too became flaccid with the most exquisite care kept to push them aside and like a burgeoning evil a huge opalescent bladder ascended from beneath them pushing them aside ruthlessly a cloudy and glimmering bladder seething with corruption and shifting patterns of blood it bobbed restlessly over the intestines. It was attached from below by a rope deeper in color than itself. Now this is the vital moment, said Kepta, working with sure hands. We will now look very carefully at the ovary. The slightest carelessness will explode this bladder and fill her whole belly with death. He exposed the yellow-white ovary. Aha, said Kepta. It is in good health. We shall save it after all. You are too preoccupied. Use more pads. Hold the flesh aside firmly. And all at once, the whole seemed dim and dimmed and flickered before Lucanus's eyes. The smell of blood almost overpowered him. His legs trembled violently and there was a huge dry retching in his stomach. He said to himself, if I fail this girl, if I faint, who will help? He looked at the wicked, restless bl bladder force come upon his natural human revulsion. He tried to observe the layers of fat over the peritoneum, yellowish and wet as sheep's fat. He pressed the pads harder against the yawning mouth of the wound, and his muscles tensed, and he sweated. Kepta was neatly tying the lengths of the cord of the bladder in several places, pulling the linen thread tightly. 
the opalescent corruption dimmed to a milkiness, the patterns of blood darkened. Then with a slow motion of the scalpel, Kepta cut the cord. The bladder lay quiet on the intestines. With the utmost care and slowness, Kepta lifted it from its position and dropped it on the tray. Lucana's eyes were swimming and drops of water dripped from his face. Watch how I sew these layers now as neatly as a seamstress. Not an error must be made in the sutures. He employed a crisscross pattern using a clear thread, which he explained was catgut. The body will absorb these in time and the joinings will be firmer than before. Some physicians use linen thread, which the body doesn't absorb and which later causes difficulties. The evil bladder was as large as a curled newborn child on the tray. Taking infinite pains, the physician brought each layer of the belly together, sewed it firmly. The fat is difficult, sometimes separates from the thread or tears apart. There, there, we have it now. And now for the skin, which is very tough. Now here we use linen thread, which we will cut away in a week. The belly had become miraculously flat. The girl groaned over and over, catching her breath with desperate sobs. She is wakening, said Kepta. He tied the last expert knot. He dipped a cloth in hot water and wrung it out and put it over the girl's heart. Then he dipped another cloth and wrapped it over her feet and another over her wrists. He bent his head and pressed it against the girl's breast. Rapid but strong, she'll not have shock, which is much to be feared. Use the bucket close to her mouth and hold her head. He wrapped large white strips of cloth over the body as though they were grave wrappings. He stood back and regarded the girl contentedly. He was very calm. He glanced at Lucanus and saw that the youth's tunic was wet and dripping. He laughed gently. Well, you have endured it very well. I congratulate you. Drink this wine as fast as possible. You know, I may even say I'm proud of you. The girl opened dull eyes. Kepta bent over her. It's all over now, my child. You are well. The girl moaned, began to cry. Kepta crushed more acrid leaves and pressed the potion into her mouth, gave her water. She swallowed feebly. She was as white as death. Sleep, he said. Sleep cures more illnesses than any doctor's art. He nodded at Lucanus. I noticed with pleasure that you've kept count of the restraining pads. Now you will clean up this mess and you'll visit her in a few hours. Glaucus? whispered the girl. Kepta moved aside the screen and summoned the husband who came in like the wind. 
he knelt beside her, his wife, and laid his cheeks to her, sobbing. It is much more rigorous on the husband, observed Captain Riley. He left Lucanus to the filthy and repulsive job of removing all evidences of the operation. Lucanus' hands moved weakly and with wincing. He washed the scalpels and replaced them on the tray. The smell of the blood was sickening and all the effluvia of the violated body. Why couldn't a slave have done this labor? He was irritated. When he emerged from the screens, he found Kepta Jane Lee conversing with other patients and giving orders. Kepta said to him, You will not always have an assistant. Too often a surgeon must stand alone and do everything himself. He looked at Lucanus and hastily caught up a bucket, and Lucanus vomited violently into it until it seemed that his very entrails and stomach and liver would leave his gaping mouth. Kepta was patient. Again, I congratulate you, my Lucanus. Better to indulge oneself after the emergency than during it. Go and lie down until you're ready for Kusa. Lucanus wiped his sour mouth. I prefer to go home. No, said Kepta. You would dwell too much on what has happened. Now gird yourself. Continue with your work. The autumn winds mourned like the voices of a multitude of doves when Lucanus left the schoolroom. The gray rains drifted against the palms and the trees and through the colonnades of the house of Diodorus. And now suddenly the sea voice scale whitened every leaf, every branch and trunk, blanched the grass, a muted howling rose from the earth, a most dolorous sound. Lucanus pulled the hood of his mantle over his head and gazed somberly at the bleached and writhing garden. The fountains complained in distress. The statues ran with gray water. The flowers bent their heads in docile suffering. Lucanus was young. He forgot that tomorrow all would be smiling and warm, the palms glittering, the birds singing to an azure sky. As it was now to him, so it would always be, torn with ragged anguish, replying feebly to the wind that roared in from the sea, bending endlessly and helplessly like the grasses of the ghostly Elysian fields. All is dead, said Lucanus to himself. All is beaten. All is gray. All is inundated. All is withered and drowned and lost. What I have loved is gone. Lucanus wiped his wet face with a corner of his mantle and felt a most frightful desolation in himself, a hollowness unfilled by a single dream or hope. His young flesh was weighty on his bones, as if that flesh were old and drenched and sodden with earth. He looked at the vaporous sky as colorless as death itself. 
and he wanted to weep. But there were no tears in him, only an aridness when nothing grew and nothing stirred. He longed to go home, yet he shrank from the thought. Iris, his mother, would be there, her beautiful face white with silent grief. She would gaze at him questioningly, and he had no answers for her. She was old. She was 31. The elderly possessed no wisdom, only queries. Only youth had the replies, and it could reply only when it was happy. In truth, said Lucanus in his heart, there is no answer to nothingness, and nothingness is all that there is. Then he was filled with a wild and tumultuous rage, and he lifted clenched fists against the sky. I shall defeat you! I shall deprive you of your sacrifices! The sea voice gale blew along his fast, his face and body, and he felt it as a mocking and challenge. He began to walk through the gardens, trembling with fury, and came to the open portico before the house. The carved bronze doors were shut. He stood and stared at them and felt them obdurate. He strode to them without thinking and struck them with a fist. When they opened, he said to the slave, I wish to talk with your master, Diodorus. The chief of the hall regarded him impudently. The master is in his library, is not spoken for many days. Do you wish to intrude upon him, Lucanus? He won't see you, he's refused his Roman friends. Will he see the son of a freedman? Lucanus thrust open the door and hurled the slave aside. The spectral and watery light from the sky fell onto the black and white marble of the hall, and Lucanus went over it, his sandals echoing, his white mantle flowing about him in ghostly folds. The cool, dank air of the house was like the air from a tomb, musty and unliving. No voice or movement broke the silence except the slapping of Lucina's feet. The archway of the library was shrouded in thick brown cloth, and this Lucanus pushed away. Only when he stepped into the library did he suddenly wonder where he had come and what he was doing here. Diodorus was sitting at a pale marble table. Many books rolled about him, his head in his hands. He was as still as a statue carved in dark bronze, for even his tunic was of deep color. When he heard the rustling of the curtain, he dropped his hands heavily and lifted a lightless face and stared at Lucanus blankly. Lucanus, whom he had not seen since the death of Rubria. Lucanus was stunned by his patron's appearance, at the ashen color of his cheeks, at the dryness of his mouth, at the hollows in which his dull eyes lurked, was spark without sparkle or interest. The very flesh of the tribune seemed to have withered. His shoulders sagged listlessly, and when he moved a little, 
It was with an effort. The chemist suddenly felt his own youth, the strength of his body, the flexibility of his limbs, the vitality of his blood in spite of his sorrow and his bottomless anger. Here, as his mother had said, was absolute despair beyond the reach of consolation. What? murmured Diodorus, as though he didn't recognize the young man. He watched Lucanus approach him and with complete uninterest, he watched while Lucanus knelt beside him, his head bent on his chest. A muffled sound came from Diodorus, a weary and fathomless sound. Then he dropped his head in his hands again and forgot his visitor. Words involuntarily came to Lucanus lips. Master, there's an old story which my father told me. An old man lost his only son and his friends came to him and said, why do you weep? Nothing can bring back your son. And the old man said, That is why I weep. The one high window in the library, admitting, admitting wandering and crepuscular light, shadowy and vague, silence filled the room. The youth knelt by the man, and both were motionless. Then Diodorus slowly and falteringly put his hand on Lucina's shoulder. He said in that rusty voice, You too loved her, but you're not her father. I lost my father said Lucanus, and turned his cheek so that it rested on the hand of Diodorus. His words came in a fierce rush. Look upon me, noble tribune. I am a son who came not to hate his father, but to despise him lightly as a man of little learning and of many pretensions. I became arrogant and impatient and condescending. I forgot all he had suffered, all he had known. I no longer found him bombast, touching. I found him risable. I did not lose my father in those years, but my father lost his son. And now the son has lost his father and I can't reach him and ask his forgiveness for cruelty and impatience, and the pride of youth. Diodorus' hand lay still on Lucana's shoulder, and for the first time life returned to the Tribune's eyes and sympathy. He couldn't see the face of Lucanus, hidden as it was in the shadow of the hood. He said very gently, Surely the gods did not reject contrition, and surely the shades in the regions of death are aware of repentance. But Lucana shook his head, unable to speak. I honored my father. I'm not a man with understanding. I can imagine what it must be to remember that one despised his father. Aeneas was a good man and honorable. I trusted him without reservation. If he strove for wisdom, the striving was not despicable. It's only when a man does not strive that he is less than an excellent dog. 
Let us honor those who know in their hearts that they are not great, for they respect and reverence greatness. Yes, but that doesn't absolve me. Diodorus didn't speak for a few moments. Then he said, as if thinking aloud, it is good so to live that when a loved one dies, one has no regrets. But who doesn't have regrets? Who has not been rude and harsh and unfeeling at times? Who has not been human with all faults? Why then should we punish ourselves and cry aloud, if only I had known, if only I had watched, then perhaps I could have held back death with my bare hands before it was too late. Wonder ran like frail light over his tortured face, and his shoulders lifted. He said, I have often said to myself that I was remiss, that I didn't guard my child more closely, that if I had been more careful, she might not have died. But now I see the gods have the hours of choosing, and we could do nothing but pray for the souls who have left us, that they will have peace, and that they will know we have loved them, and will continue to love them. But the dryness became dustier in Lucanus, and what Diodorus had said was only an echo with no meaning. Yes. Yes! Why have I drawn away from life? Why have I been less than a brute who mourns and then resumes his living? What the gods will, so be it. They need not answer for us and they may not need not answer us, for their nature is beyond our understanding. He shook his head vehemently, his hand clenched on Lucina's shoulder. I've left my poor wife to cry alone in her bed, and she, the mother of my daughter, and heavy with child. I've abandoned her, and when she came to console me, I turned her from turned from her. Did she suffer? Did she wander in an empty room? Did she miss a maiden's voice and that maiden her very flesh? What was that to me, the hating, the embittered, who wished to revenge himself for the loss of his daughter? Look at us. Surely the merciful God sent you to me today. Had I brooded much more, I should have fallen on my own sword. I will revenge her, Lucanus whispered to himself. I will revenge her all my life. Diodorus looked down at the kneeling youth, whose hard white face was hidden in the hood, and it seemed to the tribune that here was a messenger from Olympus itself. He put his knotted shoulders, arms, he put his knotted soldier's arms about the young man's shoulders as a father embraces his son. We have no longer to pray to be absolved of our crimes against the dead, but of our crimes against the living. Let us then rise like men and go about the business of life. The living await us. Then, like Odius and his son, they wept together, and the tears of Diodorus were healing, but the tears of Lucanus were like scalding acid. Lucanus went through the dripping forest to his home, 
And he said numbly and incredulously, what was it that I said to him? What message did I bring him? In truth, I said nothing at all. I talked about my father, for whom I do not truly grieve, but for whom I only feel regret. When I spoke, my thoughts were with Rubriot and not with Ines, my father. And she and I will avenge against whatever gods there be. Diodorus went to his wife's chamber where she was lying in sadness on her bed. She started up when her husband entered. And when she saw his face, she knelt on her bed with a sobbing cry and held out her arms to him. And he held her to him while she cried on his shoulder. Forgive me, beloved, he said to her, and his tears mingled with hers. Iris, standing in the gloomy and foggy dusk of the evening at her door, saw her son approach, and she waited for him, not hailing him, or greeting him. He came out into the house and threw off his cloak, and she saw the pallor of his lips, the blue and stony hardness of his eyes. She said, You have seen Diodorus. I prayed that you would go to him, for you have remembered that he is a father to you. Tell me, is he still broken with sorrow? Lucana's eyes flickered. There's something which I don't understand, and which I may have understood when I was a thoughtless child. I spoke with Theodorus. I spoke with him, not of Rubria, but my father. And he stood up and he was like a man reborn. Don't ask me what I said, for I don't remember. Iris had lit a lamp. She turned and faced her son, and never had she seemed so beautiful to him, so clothed in golden light, so like a statue carved by Phidias. She went to Lucanus and put her hand gently against his cheek. They to whom the gods give a message don't always understand that message. And for the first time since Anas had died, she smiled. Others hear and their hearts answer. Never had Lucana spoken roughly to his mother, but now he did so. You talk foolishly. You talk as a woman, and women babble of nothing. Ah, I'm sorry. Don't cry, mother. You have the tenderest heart. But I feel nothing except hatred and desire for revenge, and that revenge I shall have. He went into his room, not aimlessly, but with purpose. He took rolls of books from his shelves, little lamp, and began to study. And that's it. Oh, sickening in part of that chapter. Hope you weren't eating at the time you read it. I, you heard me read it. Chapter 13 is next. That was chapter 12. And we are right now only 27% through this book. Now, that's why I say, hold on. The best is yet to come. Dr. Lacanus will meet Dr. Luke.